Uh, Emery won, uh, has won numerous prestigious awards, truly prestigious awards. I will not count uh, any of them here, but I strongly encourage you to take a look at the meeting invitation, which includes a short biography. I would just like to say that uh, Emery is a, a rare kind of polymath. He made multiple fundamental uh, contributions to statistical analysis of neural data, uh, and he is a, a practicing anesthesiologist. Um, and um, I look forward to his talk uh, and as neuromodulation is uh, coming to focus at the Allen Institute. I believe it will be very timely and interesting. And uh, with that, Emery, it's a pleasure and please take it away. Great, Ugar, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here and to take part in your, in your, your seminar series. So I'm gonna talk about general anesthesia, neuromodulation, altered states of arousal. Because basically, general anesthesia is one of the most common forms of neuromodulation that takes place on a day-to-day -day basis. And just like all, just like the neuromodulation is done in formal experiments, studying this can also help us understand the brain and also help us develop better techniques for providing neuromodulation, in my case, general anesthesia. So these are some of the funding sources I've had the good fortune to have, support from NIH, support from my Department of Anesthesiology at Mass General Hospital, and also the institutes to which I belong at, at MIT. So this is the outline I'm gonna follow. I'm gonna talk about anesthesia-induced slow delta oscillations. I'll then go over just some other anesthesia factoids that I think uh, everyone should know. And then we'll talk about multimodal general anesthesia. We'll see how that's derived from the, um, the, the other principles that I've laid out uh, prior to this. Then I wanna end up by talking about closed loop control of general anesthesia and the, and the concept of reanimation, turning the brain back on after anesthesia. So let's begin with the definition. What is general anesthesia? It's a drug-induced reversible state that consists of four conditions. So anti-nociception, meaning loss of nociceptive processing, unconsciousness, amnesia, akinesia, and stability and control of the physiological system. And I started the anti-nociception because when we first wrote this definition back in, in 2010 in the New England Journal article, I didn't say this as cleanly. I said analgesia. But analgesia refers to pain sort of controlling pain, and pain is a conscious precept. So and nociception, it refers to the nociceptive system being active even when someone's unconscious. So we have to achieve anti-nociception. You know, one of the things which is commonly said is that it's not clear how anesthesia works. And I mean, nothing could be further from the truth. There are multiple ways in which the drugs are altering the dynamics within the brain. But one of the principal ways I'm gonna show you here is by generating oscillations, which impair the ability of various parts of the brain to communicate. And, and so it, it's good that we have it because it, it allows us to take care of patients so that they can have surgeries or, or diagnostic procedures that are invasive. But also we, we're starting to see that it's having many sort of distasteful sort of side effects, which we'd like to control and sort of reduce, particularly in older patients. And I'll talk a bit about that. So let's talk about anesthesia-induced low oscillations. So this is a cartoon which I made up based on some work that was done by the very well-known Belgian um, neurophysiologist, Frederick Breme. So Breme did these experiments in cats and he first transected the spinal cord uh, from, the, from the brainstem at about the level of A. And when he measured the EEG in the cats, he saw what looked like an awake appearing EEG and he called it the encephalizole or the isolated encephalon. Then another set, set of cats, he did the same experiment except now he transected at this level here, which gets most of the brainstem above and the cerebrum, the, most of the brainstem below and the cerebrum above. And when he measured the EEG there, he saw slow delta oscillations. And so he called that the silvo, he's the silvo in the sense of cerebrum. And that, those experiments were some of the first early experiments that led us to appreciate there's something in this region here that has to do with arousal. And one of the main points that I wanna make is that all the anesthetics have targets there and they produce slow oscillations by hitting different targets. So just because you see a slow oscillation doesn't mean it has, it has the same properties. And, 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 and because, and that's gonna dictate, it's when one of the things that sort of dictates, you know, the, the, the degree of the effect that the anesthetic has on, on the brain. So let me just show you what this looks like in a small video. Um, so we can put EEG on all our patients in the operating room. And so this is a woman I took care of, you know, several years ago now. She has, um, she's going to have thyroid surgery and she weighs about, uh, she weighs about 80 kilos and 
She's about 60 years old. So I'm going to give her just a bowl of propofol, 150 milligrams, a very standard dose. And I'll just play the video just to show you what, what happened. So the first thing you're going to see is it's going to get very noisy. That's because when you inject propofol, particularly like in a vein, like the one on the back of the hand, it burns like crazy. So the patient's tense. You see all that noise is coming on the EEG there now. That's because they're tensing up. It burns. Right? That's actually going to be good from a pedagogical standpoint. This will be able to see exactly what it does. Another six. So watch what happens right here. Now, you see those oscillations, they change dramatically. They get deeper, low oscillation, even deeper. And then now what she's going to do, she's going to go flat and then burst, flat. And burst. So this is what we just went through. She was awake here showing, and we saw what our most most likely gamma oscillations. So they're very small amplitude oscillations, you know, high frequency. And this is where we do most of our processing when we're, you know, when we're conscious. And then we saw her go right to the state here. And when I said, watch this change, she went to the state of like beta oscillations. And these beta oscillations are, they're sedative, they mark a sedative state. So if I wanted to sedate her just enough so that she could have a colonoscopy or a procedure which didn't require full general anesthesia, I would dial the propofol up until I got the beta oscillation and I would hold it there to maintain them. Then we saw her next go into this, the very large, actually this state here, E, so the very large slow oscillations. And that's gonna be the key to let us know from what Breme told us that there's something happening in the brainstem. Now the propofol is going everywhere. Cortex, thalamus, also the brainstem. So it's having effects there too. But a good deal of this initial effect that we see here is certainly happening in the brainstem. And that's what, that's what I'll talk about for propofol, as well as two other anesthetics. Then we saw her go into burst depression, which is a very deep state of anesthesia. And also between the bursts, she was isoelectric. So these are states of coma, right? The same, we see them in states of, we see them when patients are in coma, let's say from trauma or, or, ischemic, or ischemic injury. And what we try to do is we try to maintain you in this state here. This is, un, this is sufficiently unconscious so that you can have surgery, but not sort of overdoing it. And you can see that there's a slow oscillation here. You can see it right there. And there's a higher frequency oscillation riding on top of it, about, about 10 hertz or so. So that, that's a state which we try to produce with propofol and the other GABAergic anesthetics. And we know that a person is sufficiently unconscious. I just want to say a little bit about propofol's flow delta oscillations and also a bit about its alpha oscillations. So in the operating room, what we see here is we can watch this on, on the monitor. We can watch a spectrogram. So this is a woman I took care of a few years back. She's going to have a small procedure. She's about 19 years of age. I inject propofol back over here, and you see the slow oscillations come on. And then right at the time of the slow oscillation come on, a very strong band of 10 hertz oscillations comes on as well. So this is the classic signature of propofol being infused into a young person. A 10 hertz oscillation here and a slow delta oscillation that you, that you basically see here. And it's maintained the whole time. So again, this is time on this axis, this is frequency on this axis, and the colors tell us, you know, the power of the oscillation in, at, at, at any given frequency. So she has a very strong, a lot of power, around 10 hertz and a lot of power during the 0 0.1 to about 4 hertz range. And then you turn the propofol off, she, the oscillations break up, and somewhere over here she wakes up. So that I can see in the operating room. This isn't enhanced or anything like that. It looks just this, just this clear in the operating room. So where is, what's really happening here? So we have to look for brainstem targets because I want to talk about the slow oscillation. So what are the principal brainstem targets for propofol? Well, propofol comes to the, to the brainstem through the basal artery, which runs right along here on the underside of the ponds. And then it hits all these networks right here, which are the network coming out of the preoptic area, the hypothalamus, which basically synapse on pretty much all the arousal systems, the ventral periaqueductal gray, lateral dorsal tegmental tract, peduncular pontine tegmental tract, dorsal raphe, locus ceruleus. So, so these are inhibitory, in, GABA, GABAergic inhibitory synapses. So propofol can take advantage of that. And actually, this is probably the site where it's acting when we're generating those slow oscillations. Now, as I said, it's also acting in the cortex. It's also acting, it's also acting in the 
around the thal and the reticular thalamus, because that's another large inhibitory network. So it's acting in all these places, all these places simultaneously, but it does have a major brainstem target as would be predicted by what I call Brehme's principles. And just to say a little bit more about that, um, we studied this in, in detail in humans as well as in non-human primates. So as you know, patients come to have epilepsy surgery, they get electrodes implanted, and they, they, they stay in the hospital off of medications for a period of five to seven days. And after the care team determines where they, what's the most likely location of the epileptic focus, they bring them back to the operating room and they remove the electrodes and, and uh, they eventually go on to have their surgery. Well, when you come back to the operating room to have the electrodes removed, you have a natural experiment. You can watch how neurons and also field potentials change as a person goes into the state of general anesthesia. And that's what I'm showing here. So here's a, here's a patient. You can see the neurons that are spiking here. And this is a neuron which is next to the red electrode, which is, and this is the local field potential coming from the red electrode, the blue, and also the green one here. So, and look what happens now when the person's unconscious. There are those large slow oscillations. So here, the neuron can spike anywhere where, that it wanted to. And now it's spiking like, like now, now, now. It's spread out by roughly about two seconds or so. So if that's happening all across the cortex, it's going to be very, very difficult for the neurons to communicate. And so you can understand why this oscillations are so strongly associated with producing a, a state of unconsciousness. And we went further with this, thanks to Earl Miller and his, his postdoc, Andre Bastos, and our PhD student, Jake, Jacob, um, Jake Donahue, where we did the same sort of experiment, except now in the non-human primates, we could obviously implant electrodes wherever we want. So we had electrodes in two frontal areas, 8A and, and prefrontal cortex, and also in posterior parietal cortex and superior temporal gyrus. And then this is what the neurons are doing. So just to put this in the context, here are those sort of gamma oscillations we were talking about before. And here are the neurons spiking in these various regions. And the spike rate's around 10 spikes per second. And then after getting the propofol, here are the large slow oscillations like we were talking about just a second ago. And then if you look here, you can see there are these huge up-down states. So they seem to go across all four of the regions simultaneously. So spiking here, no spiking, spiking here. But even when the neuron spikes, it's spiking far less than it was spiking when it, when the when the animal was conscious. And in this particular case, the um, this particular case, the spike rates have dropped to one half to one spike per second. So something about a 90, 95 percent drop in spike rate. And again, so I, what I would assert is that in this state here, I don't know how much the spike rate has to drop for the animal to become unconscious. But I would submit to you that in this state, the animal is profoundly unconscious because, and it's going to be very, very difficult to for the various regions to communicate. And if anything, the regions have actually become a little more synchronized, you know, so they're off at the same time and they're on at the same time. So in addition to sort of shutting down, they're actually synchronized. And this is one of the ways in which propofol is in, in producing unconsciousness. Let's talk about ketamine because ketamine has been in the news a lot in the last several years because low-dose ketamine is now a very um, effective, is demonstrated to be a very effective therapy against uh, for treatment for treatment resistant depression. And ketamine has some very interesting dynamics. And this is work which is done by Andy Garwood, who's one of my PhD students who just finished up, and Suresh Chakravarti, one of my postdocs. So ketamine, actually, when you give a low dose of it, you get a high frequency oscillation like the one you're seeing here. And then it sort of shows up in the spectrogram here. And it's, it's quite high frequency. It's, you know, 30 to 40 hertz or so. And then if you give a larger dose such that the person becomes unconscious, and you can actually do surgery on them. If they're finally unconscious, they can do surgery. The, the, the lower dose I was talking about would just create sedation. You actually oscillate between this high frequency state and this low frequency state. So it goes, and you can see it here on the, on the spectrogram. So high frequency, slow, high frequency, slow. And that's the signature that you see for, pro, for ketamine, which is quite different from the dynamics we just saw with propofol. And again, just following through on Brehme's principle, so propofol works by blocking by blocking NMDA receptors, but it's more than that. It has some very detailed interaction with the receptor. It just doesn't block it. It, it can create very, several different states of the, of the receptor, which affects the circuitry around it. So, but, with, but speaking specifically about brain targets for the, pro, for the ketamine, we can see the, para, the, the um, parabrachial nucleus 
and the pontine reticular formation are, are two very powerful glutamatergic sites which um, project out of the brainstem into the basal forebrain and the central thalamus. So we could we could conjecture that that's the location of slow oscillations coming from coming from uh, coming from uh, ketamine. And then what Indy did was she actually repeated the experiments in non-human primates. So the data that I was showing before was in humans. And in non-human primates, she studied this the, the switch between these two dynamics. And it just doesn't go fast, slow, fast, slow. It actually goes slow, a little faster, a little faster, fast, and then back to slow. So there are about four states that it jumps through. So she used the hidden Markov model to describe this. So if you take this little section of the EEG here, you can see this. Fast oscillation here, the gamma oscillations, and the slow oscillations down here. And now you can see the, if you blow that up, you can see the, the fast oscillations here, the slow. And so here it is going from a slow state, a little faster, a little faster, quite fast, then dropping down to slow again and continuing to repeat. So there, there are a number of intermediate stages that this dynamic goes through that is that occurs when the person is profoundly unconscious under, under ketamine, which is a dynamic which is entirely different from what you see the propofol. And if you look at this um, in, in more detail, what India was able to show that roughly about 50% of the time, all the all the sites, the four regions where she was recording, are, are in synchrony. About 67% of the time, the um, the posterior regions are in in, in uh, are in, are synchronized, and then about roughly 80 plus percent of the time, the two frontal regions are are synchronized. So again, what you see is a, a very drastic change in dynamics. And along with you know synchrony where there wouldn't necessarily be synchrony before, so this this you can start to understand why these oscillations could impede communication. And then I'll just talk about one final drug, dexmedetomidine, because often people ask us, you know, is there one of your anesthetics which could be as close to like producing a state like sleep? And the one that does is dexmedetomidine. And when you give it at low doses, you actually see spindles just like you see during during sleep, and here they are, these are sort of, you can see them here in the time domain trace here, these spindle activities, sort of waxing, waning, alpha oscillations. So these are these are quite different from alpha oscillations because you can see they're feathery, they're, they're more evanescent than, than the alpha oscillation that we saw at propofol. Then when you, so this looks just very much like non-REM stage two sleep. And then here, at higher doses, you actually see the sort of just slow oscillation, sort of like non-REM stage three sleep. And then, the um, dexmedetomidine has a number of sites of action, but there are four principal ones that are relevant for this discussion. So coming out of the brainstem here, the locus ceruleus sends, is responsible for neuroprene neuro neuro providing neuroprenephrine to the, um, the cortex, to the basal forebrain, to the central thalamus, as well as synapsing on the preoptic area of the hypothalamus. And what, Ketamine, what, uh, what dexmedetomidine does, is it acts presynaptically to block this release of neuroprenephrine. And so what that, that's just like pulling away a major excitatory pathway from the, from the, uh, fr from the cortex and, and thalamus. So, it's, so that, that's the way, that's one of the principal ways also that we think that sleep is initiated. And so it makes sense that, again, because you have this decreasing in arousal inputs going to the cortex, that you would start to see slow oscillation, just like we talked about. So there, there are three other cases where we also see slow oscillation. So if you have a very young brain, so kids under the age of three, under the age of three months of age, under sevoflurane, which is an ether, but it still works by GABAergic mechanisms, you see only slow oscillation. Something magical happens at four months of age, the the alpha oscillations start to form, and it, it's um and what we think is that. This represents the finally the, the maturation of the thalamocortical circuits because the alpha oscillation, which I didn't talk that much about, we believe is an oscillation going back between the thalamus and cortex. In older patients, you know, we often see just slow oscillations. And there, it's not because the connections haven't formed, it's quite the, it's quite the opposite. Probably connections between the thalamus and cortex are, are, are breaking down because you have a 78-year-old person, their synapses, their their neurons are, are 78 years of age. So they produce less neurotransmitter, the dendrites don't extend and retract as much as they used to. They, they, um, the cell volume declines, the mitochondria don't work as well. So you can start to understand why this might occur, but why specifically alpha as opposed to 
let's say Delta as well, is not clear to us. It's something that we're investigating. And also patients with overwhelming sepsis as well show um, just slow oscillations. This was a gentleman I took care of who was, who had, uh, a, who was a, a drug addict who had a necrotizing infection in his arm. He had to come back to the operating room every three or four days to have it cleaned. And when I put the EEG on him, and I was just, I, I was blown away because he's 34 years of age. I expect to see a nice, rich sort of alpha band here, just like I showed you in the young woman just a few slides ago. But all I saw was just these slow oscillations. And, you know, Mark Ott, who's a neuroscientist, who's there in the University of Washington, has basically shown that inflammatory mediators actually bind to the arousal centers and can shut them down. So it makes sense that if you have, if you have a, a large amount of inflammation, that it could impair the the uh, the functioning of various circuits, and so then the conjecture would be that once the inflammation is resolved, you'd expect to see the oscillations come back. So we've been thinking about this or are saying this for for a while. We finally got some clinical evidence of it just recently. So this is a patient that um, Christian Gay, who's one of my clinical po postdocs, was taking care of during COVID, and you can see the gentleman's chest here. He's got this very bad pneumonia and it's it's progressively clearing up. You see his lungs are clearer and clearer. So this is his, his EEG on day, day zero. You can see he just has slow oscillations. But then by day three, when his lungs have gotten clearer, his infection is much better controlled, his alpha oscillations come back. You can see that in the time domain trace here. There's not even a hint of an alpha oscillation here. And now you can see them that they come back here. So. This is so state of the state of health can also affect dramatically the oscillations that we see in patients under anesthesia. So just some other anesthesia factoids, things which I think everyone who's in neuroscience should be aware of. So first of all, the state, the, the response to anesthesia changes dramatically with age also. So here's the 31 year old who's receiving 30 year old who's receiving propofol, just like the, the figure I showed you just the, of the young woman a, a few slides back. And you can see the, the 10 hertz oscillation, the slow oscillation. And then over here, here's a gentleman who's 57. So he could be his father. And he has, you know, the, the slow oscillation, the, I'm sorry, the 10 hertz oscillation, which you can see, is slightly lower. It's between 8 to 12 hertz, and where up here it's between 10 to 15. And that's exactly what we see. It tends to move down essentially with age. But you can see he has a very strong slow oscillation. And his alpha oscillation is probably not as strong as his, but it's still very apparent. Now, this is a woman I took care of uh, several years back who was having a tumor the size of an American football removed from her chest. It took the thoracic surgeons the better part of um, better part of six hours in order to do that. And you can see that there's a total loss of anything up here in the in sort of the gamma range whatsoever. You can see maybe a faint 10 hertz oscillation at best and extremely weak uh, slow delta oscillations. And so by following this woman's EEG, I was able to give her one third of the already age adjusted dose of of the drugs and actually keep her adequately un un unconscious because I was using the EEG to track her brain state. And then here's something that's really sobering. These two guys are roughly the same age. His EEG looks like his, his EEG looks like hers. So when you first see this, you say, well, wow, what's going on? Well, we age different physically. It makes sense that our brains age differently as well, too. And what's interesting is, you know, anesthesia might reveal this. Um, you know, so think of this, forget about this as a, as a using anesthesia for the purpose of putting someone in a state so they can tolerate surgery. Think of this as a neuroscience experiment. I put in a stimulus, the stimulus is basically the anesthesia. The brain oscillates, and depending upon the state of the integrity of that brain, it may oscillate, you know, appropriately or maybe less so. So there, we, we certainly realize there's a concept of brain age and, you know, anesthesia might be one way of sort of revealing it. And then just on the other end of the age back, you can probably guess what the kids look like. So there's a three-year-old and there's a 14-year-old. You can see this have the same patterns, but their 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 powers over a much broader range of, of frequencies. So this needs to be taken into account when you're taking care of kids, because if this could be misinterpreted, and someone is just accustomed to taking care of adults as a person being awake, but actually this is a three-year-old who's profoundly anesthetized. And this power, which sort of that you see here, that's really substantial, 
it turns out it peaks at about six to eight years of age. That's when it's at its highest. And after that, it, it gradually declines over time, as you can sort of see across these other, these other cases. One other factoid, which I think everybody should be aware of, general anesthesia is not sleep. Right? We often say sleep to patients when we're about to induce general anesthesia. We say that, you know, excuse me, Mr. Sunset, I want to have you go off to sleep for your operation, but don't worry, I know how to wake you up. Um, and it's, it's a bad habit because, it, 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 as I said, general anesthesia is not sleep. What I actually say to patients is that, Ms. Mr. Jones, I'm going to take good care of you. You're going to be unconscious. You won't form any memories. You won't, you won't feel any pain or anything. And you, we may relax your muscles so it's easier for the surgeons to operate. And we'll, we'll watch all your vital signs and make sure that they, they, stay, they stay stable. So I just give them the definition of general anesthesia. I don't, I don't try to create a metaphor because the metaphor doesn't work. And as we know, when you, when you have sleep, so this is the eyes closed alpha oscillation you can see posteriorly when someone closes their eyes and they're awake. And here's just sort of like the, the frontal gamma oscillation that I was showing you at the outset. So with sleep, we go through non-REM one, two, three, then back up to REM. This, so we do that about every 90 minutes, four to six times a night. We typically wake up from REM sleep. You know, the REM is like, the brain is, is more awake, it's active, it's, it's probably doing tasks. And during, there's more sort of maybe resting, sort of, sort of doing some, uh, <clears throat> some, some pruning of information during the slow wave states. Whereas here, this is, so this is a physiologic process alternating between, you know, probably three or four states. Whereas here, what happens is we bring you down to a state like this and we just hold you there and keeping the brain oscillating. And then once we're done, we turn off the drugs and let the oscillation disappear. So you can think of these as basically pathologic oscillations because they're not, they're not normal. And once you see that, you can understand why they would probably make you unconscious. You can also understand why older people would have brain dysfunction after anesthesia because they spend you know, several hours under anesthesia having, the, having their brain be in the state. And then when, they, when the anesthesia is turned off, the brain just doesn't flip back to being normal again. It, it may require some time and some people may require a substantial amount of time. So general anesthesia is not sleep. So multimodal general anesthesia. This is my colleague, Marusta Naranjo, who's an anesthesiologist, very talented anesthesiologist in, uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. And she has taught me a, a lot about multimodal anesthesia, which we, I'm going to explain in just a second. But she was pushed to try to think in these terms, like trying to think of different ways to control nociception during anesthesia, because she noticed that when she used opioids, she had a high fraction of her patients who were would become nauseated or vomiting. And she conjectured, she hasn't shown this yet, that had to do with she has a high fraction of people there who have Mayan descent. It, can, it, it sort of consistently happened in that, in that population. So what does multimodal general anesthesia mean? So here's how we typically give anesthesia. We've, we induce anesthesia by giving a drug like propofol. It's called a hypnotic, makes you unconscious. You could also do it with one of the inhaled drugs. And inhaled drugs that we use like sevoflurane, isoflurane, desfrane, they're all ethers still. We use opioids primarily for antinociception, and we don't give anything for amnesia because if you're profoundly unconscious with either the inhalational drugs or the propofol, you'll be uncon you'll you'll have you'll have amnesia as well. You won't form any memories. Your memory circuits will basically be turned off. And then here, for the for the sake of to keep you immobile, or we give muscle relaxants, the anticholinergic drugs. So this is sort of what's called balanced general anesthesia. And it's just the way we've practiced. I mean, and, and the idea is to try to use just, you know, different drugs so that, you know, you, you can have more specific effects. However, we think there's a better way to, to do this than, than what's happening here. And so it should be something like this. This is what we call multimodal general anesthesia. So what you should do is you have surgery because basically surgery hurts. So you should try to maximize the antinociception by targeting not just one pathway, but multiple pathways to control nociception. One of the payoffs, if you do that, is that it reduces the amount of propofol, let's say, that you'll need to keep the patient unconscious. Then you'll need a way to monitor the state of unconsciousness. So for that, we use the EEG for the antinociception, rather than use heart rate and blood pressure. And then you should carry out a multimodal strategy postoperatively. And what what the this particular this sort of point here is really important because 
by using the antinociception to the multiple drugs to, to create the antinociception, you actually reduce the amount of propofol you need to keep the person unconscious. So it makes it easier to wake them up once you finish the, the surgery. So I'll just show you one illustration of this. This is a woman I took care of several years ago. She's 89 plus plus. As you know, HIPAA doesn't allow you to say the age of someone in a, in a, in a presentation who's over 89 years of age. So she had a history of diabetes, hypertension. She was having laparoscopic right colectomy. She's about five feet tall. She weighs about 57 kilos. But here's the regimen. I used a three-drug regimen to control her nociception. So dexmedetomidine, remifentanil, which is a synthetic opioid, dexmedetomidine, the alpha-2 agonist, and then intravenous lidocaine. And then with that, with these three drugs here helping to control nociception, I was able to give her a, a dose of 30 micrograms per kilogram per minute, about start, starting about one hour or so into the case, um, which is a, it's, it's almost a, it's a pretty much a homeopathic dose. And, but it was more than adequate for her because we were titrating it to her brain state. And then she got oral Tylenol and also I, I intravenous hydromorphone at the, end the, at, at the end of the case for postoperative pain. So here's her EEG. Not surprisingly, she has just slow oscillations. You can see them there. You can see them here in the spectrogram. Here's another illustration of them as well. And then up here, you can see her vital signs are basically quite stable. And again, another patient I was able to, you know, wake up very easily because I, I, just, I titrated her, her, her drugs just to exactly what she needed, as opposed to just sort of guessing in, in a sense or based on age and weight and height and this sort of thing. I was looking at her response as measured through the EEG and deciding how to dose the anesthetics. So here's what I just said. So you have dexmedetomidine, which is actually acting at multiple sites. It acts in the spinal cord to, to help with nociception, but it also helps decrease arousal, as we, as we talked about before, blocking the release of norepinephrine coming from you know, the locus ceruleus. So that's going to help decrease arousal. At the same time, the opioids, as we know, actually act in a number of locations, but one of the arousal pathways they work on is this cholinergic pathway going out of the lateral dorsal tegmental tract, the pontine tegmental tract, up into the thalamus. So it's not a very powerful, not a very powerful arousal pathway, but it helps. So these two together help decrease the level of consciousness. So that when you get propofol to to actually to really to make the person unconscious, you don't need to give as much because these drugs have already sort of primed the system, as it were. And so this is this is one of the, the benefits of doing this multimodal approach. So this is something that we're going to test out now in a clinical trial at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston. Hopefully this uh, either hopefully this summer or, or this fall. We're going to test it out in cardiac surgery. This is a, a protocol based on these ideas that has been written up by my colleague Bala Subramani at the, the Beth Israel Hospital in Boston, Beth Israel Deacons Hospital in Boston. So two final ideas, closed loop control of anesthesia and reanimation. So um, a few years ago, we built a closed loop control system that were to control anesthesia in rodents. And um, we went to the FDA to try to get approval to test out in humans. And they said, That's, you know, this is really nice, but you need to do it in, in an animal system, which is more close, which is closer to, closer to humans. So with the help of Earl Miller, we undertook some studies to try to build a closed loop system to, in, in non-human primates. And this was the work done by the SIBO and the postdoc, Suresh Trakrabarty and Jake Donahue, who's my PhD student. So what you first need is a marker of unconsciousness. That's what the MOU stands for. So, and you, so what you do is based on how you set that marker, that sets an infusion rate for a pump of the propofols infusing into the animal. So at the same time, the, the EEG or local field potential is being read from the head, from the brain, or from the from the scalp, and you and you can estimate what the marker is. So the difference between the marker and the target tells you whether or not you increase or decrease the the, the amount of drug being administered. And for this particular experiment, we have a duty cycle and update every every twenty seconds. So here's the here's the the important bit of science that drove this the the this the construction of this control system. So here we have a continuous infusion of propofol. And what you can see happens is that the spike rate goes down, 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 down with the, as you, with, with the continuous infusion. When the infusion is turned off, it starts to come back up. And lockstep with that, the 20, 
the power in the 2030 hertz band in the non-human primate follows this almost perfectly. So since we know that this decrease in spike rate is strongly associated with the, with the, with the animal being unconscious, we decided we could use this as a control signal. So we use the power, the power in the 2030 hertz band as our, as our mark of unconsciousness. And so just to illustrate this, so Suresh basically set this so that one would be the level he wants to keep at the outset. So what he's going to do is he's not he's going to run a constant infusion. This constant infusion is what we typically do here in the United States. We don't have target control of the anesthesia, you know, delivery systems as they have in Europe or in South America. They have not been approved by the FDA. So we want constant infusions, and we're going to see what happens to the marker. So this is where the infusion rates are going to be. This is where the marker is going to be. He's going to set it at one, and then he's going to take over control um, at, 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 after the uh, after about 35, 40 minutes. So let's just see watch what happens. Watch what happens. So here the marker is wandering. It's supposed to be at one. The infusion rate is constant, but it's wandering all over the place. <clears throat> and now what he's going to do in just a second here. Right here, he starts the controller. So with the controller, the controller grabs hold of the marker and keeps it exactly where he wants to be, right at, at this case, at one. Now he's going to take it a little bit deeper. So he goes down, the marker goes down. So going from about one down to 0.9. And then what he's going to do is he's going to take it a little bit higher. So deeper, lower is a more profound level of unconsciousness, and higher is a less profound level. So, and you see this goes up, catches the target just as it should, and tracks it. So one very important clinical thing that I want to point out right here is this. If you look right here, you see this constant infusion. With the constant infusion, the animal is just getting deeper, 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 and deeper. And so this is what's happening to our patients in the operating room. We run constant infusions without having any feedback as to what's actually happening in the patient's brain. And using the EEG is not standard practice, in, unfortunately, in, uh, in, 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 in the United States. And so what did the controller do? It actually shut off for about three minutes so that it could recapture the target. And then it went on, you know, controlling. So, so this shows that now that we've been able to do this in non-human primates, we feel that this, we can demonstrate to the FDA that this would be feasible in humans. So the next step was we're putting together a system which we'd like to test in humans. And hopefully we'll be able to start doing that sometime, if not later this year, early next year. And this is just a summary of the various experiments. So we, we did a total of 19 hours of control and nine sessions across two animals. And we did various patterns, one like the ones you saw. So kind of like an inverted top hat that you see here and here just sort of like a top hat pattern. And we had no trouble controlling the, controlling the animal's level of unconsciousness. So this sort of closed loop control of anesthesia is very feasible. So Ken did another set of experiments in which he now trains the animal to execute a task. So the animal goes and if it hits the correct light, turn around and gets a food reward. So first he's going to do the same thing and anesthetize the animal, this time using acetylchlorine. And then he's going to wake him up and the animal is going to wake up and then start executing the task. So you can see that he's behaviorally intact. He's not just He's not just sort of awake and, you know, sort of drowsy or what have you. And then Ken's going to turn, keep, he's keeping the stimulation on and keeping the anesthesia on while he's stimulating. Then he's going to turn it off and you're going to see the animal go back out. So here's, here's the experiment. So the animal is out right now. It's basically sedated with isofluorine. There's no stimulation. And again, this is an electrode plant in his ventral tegmental area. So he turns on the stimulation here. The animal comes to he goes and looks for a food reward, but there's no free lunch. So he has to actually hit the correct side. So he hits the, the left side there, right? So now he gets a reward. So he's, he's still working. So Kim, Kim changes the stimulation from 40 hertz to 20 hertz just to make see that the same thing is going on. He hits the, the correct light again. So he's cognitively processing. That's the point we're trying to make. And we, this is a little overboard while we keep the anesthesia on at the same time. Obviously, once you woke someone up, woke someone up you wouldn't leave the anesthesia on. But this is just showing you that this stimulation can work even in the presence of the anesthesia. Now watch what happens here. He's going to turn around now to start the task again. And Ken's going to turn the stimulation off, which he does. And he's back out again. 
So he was only awake because we were stimulating his arousal pathways in the ventral tegmental area. So here's what's going on. Ken is then this also with Ritalin. So when you administer Ritalin, one of the pathways that it acts on is this mesocortical pathway. It's starting in the VTA going through the limbic system, you know, on up to cortex. And so, I mean, I'm sorry, Ritalin acts as a, as a dopamine uh, reuptake inhibitor. So it keeps the arousal signal of the dopamine active in the cortex there. And then as we were showing, Ken done this also by electric stimulation as well as optogenetically by stimulating the D1 neurons in the ventral tegmental area. So this research has strongly suggested that we could identify some sorts of agents to use to wake patients up from anesthesia. And I think that, was, that would change our practice dramatically because it, it would probably help people recover cognitive function sooner as well as just, you know, helping them, helping to dissipate the effects of the anesthetic soon. So what have I shown you? I've shown you that, um, you know, anesthesia-induced slow delta oscillations are likely, one of the main, one of the mechanisms which they're produced is like the in inactivation of brainstem projections from, from the brainstem to the count through the, to the thalamus and cortex. In addition, there's also very profound hyperpolarization in the cortex and thalamus because there are tons of inner neurons around there where propofol can act directly. But this is one of the main, one of the main uh, pathways. And we, I showed you that the, the same thing could be inferred for dexmedetomidine as well as for uh, ketamine. And as I showed you, each anesthetic has a, a different class, has, a, has its own EEG signature. It changes with dose, with patient age, and also physiological condition. I showed you the uh, inflammation of the patient with uh, with, with COVID. And so, because the, but because the signatures of the drug are so strong, we can build a closed loop system with them. That's what I just showed you. However, and we can also do multimodal general anesthesia, which is what we should be doing. We use our understanding of the pain circuits to actually choose the combination of anti agents we'd like to use. And then take advantage of the fact that also decreases arousal. So it allows us to use much less of the propofol or the gases as some people, as many people typically use, to keep the person unconscious. And again, the person comes to it with a clearer head. And certainly reanimation is something that we should be doing because at the moment, recovery is a passive process. And the, the more unhealthy your brain is, the more difficult it is for you to come to from anesthesia. And that's been documented in a number of studies now. And it's also been documented that the use of EEG to guide dosing actually reduces the, the, the incidence of post-operative cognitive dysfunction, particularly in elderly patients. So this is what I'd like to see more of. So this is general anesthesia. And this is all these various phenomena, clinical neuroscience that anesthesia is directly related to. And we don't, we don't study it as much as we should. Like, as we know, we talked about the fact that ketamine is used to treat depression. Ketamine for many years is also used as a model for schizophrenia. We also know now that hibernation, the burst depression state, when like the painted turtle goes into hibernation, it has dynamics which are very much like the burst depression. That's because it actually augments the amount of GABA it produces and also heightens the sensitivity of it. So deep states of anesthesia is actually, in this, in this particular case, a model for hibernation. And we can use anesthetics, someone that's intractable epilepsy, you actually use anesthetics to actually treat it. Um, and ironically, at lower doses, methohexetol, which is a barbiturate, is actually is used to induce seizures to help facilitate the seizures for like electroconvulsive therapy. But at a higher dose, it can be used to arrest seizures. So very interesting phenomenon that, you know, which need to be studied in more detail. And, you know, uh, uh, another example is like here, as I said, in the case of sleep, dexmedetomidine probably comes very close to approximating sleep. It's been just approved as an oral medication for use in the ICU. And I think they're just about to get, the company that makes it just about to get approval to market as a sleep medication. So the point that I'm making here is there are all these connections between general anesthesia and the use of anesthetic drugs and these very important problems or, or, or phenomena in clinical neuroscience. If we paid more attention to them, we could actually learn from the research that's being done in these various fields and also, these fields could learn from our understanding of anesthesia and how the drugs work in, in various parts of the brain. And the patient, the people who would benefit from this most, of course, would be our patients. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much for the very interesting talk, Emery. Uh, we, uh, so I would like to open the Q&A session now. We received a number of questions, um, starting from the first one. This one is from Forrest Coleman. Uh, the question is, to what extent does anesthesia reproduce functional consequences of sleep, such as motor program consolidation, reduction of sleep depth, et cetera? So, so the only thing, that, as I was saying, the, the drug which comes the closest to having anything that approximates sleep is the, is the, is the dexmedetomine, which I was showing here. It's going to go right back there, right here. So, so this approximates sleep. So one of the things that it does is, and approximates is really important because it produces spindle-like states, it produces slow oscillations, but however, it produces it, it produces a superabundance of slow oscillations. So you actually lose some of your REM sleep if you were to take this as a sleeping medicine, but you'd enhance the amount of slow wave sleep. So that's why I was saying it, it approximates sleep, but it, it still it still doesn't it still doesn't uh, create, you know, sort of perfect dynamics like you have when you, when you sleep. Having said that, if you look at the other agents that are used to uh, sleep medications, if instead of sleeping medications, you call them sedatives or weak anesthetics, that's a more accurate, that's a more accurate characterization of what they're doing because they're actually acting directly in the cortex, many of them on GABAergic circuits to actually help sedate you. And then the idea is that maybe your natural sleep mechanism, you know, would take over. So we don't have a medication in, in anesthesia that actually mimics the NIP REM non REM, but this comes closest to producing a state which is very much like slow wave sleep. Thank you. Uh, next question from an anonymous attendee. How do general anesthesia properties compare to those of deep hypothermic states, such as deliberately invoked during cardiac surgery or in rare cases of rapid frigid drowning when falling into a freezing freezing lake or a snow drift? There's a second. No, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. There's a second part to the question. What do we know about states of consciousness in those scenarios? Clearly, there is absolutely no consciousness, but what details do we know about it? No, I mean, that's a very, very good question. So I just want to point out something here. See this this pattern of burst suppression that I showed? This is we can produce this with GABAergic anesthetics. It's the same pattern that you see when people are hypothermic. When they when they do hypothermic hypothermic during cardiac hypothermia, they induce hypothermia during cardiac bypass, or even still when they, even better, when they do sort of total circulatory arrest with, on hypothermic patients. So there's no blood flow, there's no oxygenation of the lungs. You know, the, the, the neurosurgeon is probably operating on a tumor that's in a very, you know, tricky place, and they have like a half hour to sort of go in there and basically remove it or what, or resect it. Um, so this state is very much like, like the hypothermia. And one of the things that we now start to appreciate is that we think that this state here is due to uh, an effect of the anesthetic on the mitochondria. That is maybe blocking the ability of the mitochondria to produce ATP and carry out respiration. And the pattern suggests that the, the hypothermia is doing something, something very, very similar. So th this state here actually mimics very much, very much the hypothermia, because when the patients become hypothermic, when they make the hypothermic with cardiac arrest, this is what you see the EEG tending towards. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, next question is from Anton Archipov. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Could you please comment on xenon anesthesia? What is its mechanism of action and phenomenology of neural activity and oscillations when xenon is used. No, that's a that's a great question. So xenon, um, I was going to also put in nitrous oxide. So xenon actually works by blocking NMDA receptors. And one of the things that you see, you see actually very profound slow oscillation of xenon anesthesia. Um, it's very expensive essentially to, to to carry out xenon anesthesia. So that's why you probably won't see it used, you know, broadly. There, there are studies of it which are going on. There's one at Mass General now. There's also one at uh, one that I know of, which is taking place in Melbourne, Australia. So it it works very similarly to to nitrous oxide and also ketamine, but it doesn't have nearly the sort of subtle effects on on the um, NMDA receptors as ketamine has. It's more like just sort of blocking the, the NMDA receptors. And what you see, like in the case of nitrous oxide, I've never given xenon myself. You see some extremely profound slow waves. I mean, they look really like sine waves. 
And we see something similar with Zeno. Interesting, thank you again. Um, next question is from Stephen Smith. There are many positive allosteric modulators of GABA-A receptors in wide use. What is special about propofol that makes it preferred for anesthesia? No, nothing. And it's not like we studied it systematically. You know, I think uh, John Glenn came up with the idea, you know, several uh, 30, 30 plus years ago and manufactured it. And, you know, it, it actually it, it acts at this, uh, you know, it, it enhances these, you know, these inward, these uh, chloride currents, hyperpolarizing, you know, the neurons. For example, like the benzodiazepines bind at a totally different site, you know, they're GABAergic also. So, in other words, if, if you're there, there hasn't been like a systematic study across all the maybe the, the parts on the GABA receptor where you could create, you know, the state or pr produce unconsciousness. And then there are people who know a lot about, you know, sort of GABA receptors. And so it's it's basically quite quite frankly to be honest, it's what we has been handed down to us. Prior prior to using propofol, we were using the barbiturates for for um, to, uh, to 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 induce unconsciousness and for sedation. But it's a much it's you're better control of sedation and also induction and recovery with propofol than we have with the barbiturates. That's why they've replaced the barbiturates. We don't we don't use the barbiturates at all now, except in the, that rare instance of what, treating epilepsy, as I was, as I said, or or to induce uh, seizures for electro electroconvulsive therapy. Thank you very much. Uh, we've gone through uh, the uh, questions that we've received in the Q and A. Oh, there's one more from mm -hmm. Kyle Travaglini. Uh, to what extent, if any, are slow delta oscillations related to breathing rate? They seem to have similar rates, and I remember learning that breathing rate is set in brainstem structures, such as pre botsy Right. So that's right. So they are set in they are set in brainstem brainstem structures, but they're lower down. So they're, they're actually the the that group is basically down here. These arousal centers are are, are up here. Now, when propofol comes up through the basal artery here, it also hits these these respiratory centers as well. And one of the things you'll see is the person, when the slow oscillations come on the EEG, the person will also stop breathing at the same time. So suggesting that it's hitting, the, hitting those same sites. So, so, so apnea or, or the cessation of respiration is a very common phenomenon and it's an expected phenomenon that we see with the bolus dosing propofol that we do to start, an, start general anesthesia. Uh, and we have two more questions now. Uh, the first one is from Matt Mallory. Uh, great talk, thank you. You showed spectrograms from two individuals about the same age under anesthesia, but one mm. appeared more similar to that of the 81-year-old. Does this correlate with the health of an individual? Uh, we actually, so we haven't proved it. Let me just say that right off the bat. But I think it really does. I mean, I, I, and um, because I mean, I, I've seen a number of cases now where where patients have had. Um, I'll just give you one example. I had a a, a young guy that I was talking to, uh, getting doing the pre anesthesia interview with, and um, something wasn't quite right. I couldn't quite figure out what it was, and so I always ask my patients, do they play sports? Because I want to know how physically active they are. So oh, yeah. He said, um, I lift weights now, but I used to play rugby. Oh, that's interesting. So when I looked at his EEG, he was, he was 33. When I looked at his EEG and I got him under anesthesia, he looked like that 56-year-old. And, you know, again, these are just, you know, sort of anecdotes, clinical anecdotes. But what I view, I view each of my patients like an observational study. And so what we should do is we should collect more of this data systematically. And I think we would basically find that they're, they're readily identifiable old brains and young brains. And whether or not we want to do it using anesthesia, it was something that was, would to be decided. Thank you. Um, this uh, question is from Ryan Raut. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, I understand the question, but may, maybe you will. Uh, what motivated 20s as the update time? Can faster be better? Oh yeah. So and the, the the duty cycle in the in the control system. Yeah. So like right now, the, the the old version of it as well as the new version is every four or five seconds. 
So we, we just set this one at 20, but no, we can do it much faster. And you, and it turns out we have like amazingly tight control with the, uh, with the updated duty cycle. And so the, the answer to can faster be better is presumably it, yes. It is yes. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because you, you, you're basically dosing every four to five seconds as opposed, or changing those potentially every four to five seconds as opposed to every 20 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask uh, one question uh, myself too. Uh, is, is there a mechanistic explanation to why the response to anesthesia changes with age? Um, I, I think I, I think that what's occurring is I think we're we're seeing the brain aging. With the, first, we're seeing the brain maturing, and then we see the brain degenerate essentially. So in the kids who are less than three months of age, right, there, the thalamic cortical connections are probably not that solid, so they can't generate alpha oscillations. As we get older, like I was saying, our neurons are as old as we are. And, and depending upon how healthy we've maintained ourselves, how, how much we've exercised, how much inflammation our brain has been exposed to, it makes sense that over time they would start to degenerate. In addition to the fact that they're just older, as I was saying, the various components of the like the myelin sheath starts to break down. The we don't make as much neurotransmitter. The mitochondria don't work as well. So I I think it's just it's it's just it's the physiology of aging that we're seeing, and it's just manifest in the response to anesthesia. You you can't generate the oscillation as robustly as you could when you were younger. Thank you very much. Uh, with this, I think we are right on time, and I would like to close the Q and A session as well. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown, for this very interesting talk. Oh, great. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.